name is Dee Logan, and I'm a project manager here at uh, the Trans Transitions to Adulthood Center for Research. And I want to thank you all for attending today's webinar, uh, Academic Coaching for College Students with Mental Health Conditions by Peer Students Pilot Results. Today's speakers are Marianne Davis from the Transitions to Adulthood Center for Research in the Department of Psychiatry at UMass Chan Medical School, and Paul Turchia and Dory Hutchinson, both from the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation at Boston University. Before we jump right into the presentation, I'm gonna go over just a few housekeeping items just so you know, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Transitions to Adulthood Center for Research's website. Uh, please use the Q&A button to send questions to the presenters. Uh, you can send them during the presentation. Uh, and then just know I will turn live captions on, which will be auto-generated by Zoom. If you have any questions how to use that, the icon to enable them is in the control panel at the bottom of your Zoom window. Please note that this is a Zoom webinar, so all participants are automatically muted with your webcams off. If you have any problems, you can email me at deirdre.logan at umassmed.edu. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marianne Davis. Thank you. Thanks, Dee. I am moving our slides forward. Oh, sorry. There we go. So I'm Marianne Davis, um, and um, this study that we're going to be um, talking to you about today comes to you from the Transitions to Adulthood Center for Research. Uh, the study uh, was funded through a Rehabilitation Research and Training Center grant from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, and from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Um, the mission of the Transitions to Adulthood Center for Research is to promote the full participation in socially valued roles of transition age youth and young adults, those who are ages 14 to 30, who have serious mental health conditions. And we're very excited to be here today to tell you about this study. Um, I'm actually gonna turn off my video because I'll be doing a little bit of reading from notes and I don't think everybody here wants to just be looking at the top of my head. So I will turn this off. Okay, so this research has been um, <clears throat> conducted with a team of individuals at the UMass Chan Medical School, Boston University, and Wright State University. So from UMass Chan Medical School, we've had Amanda Costa, Laura Golden, and Kristen Roy Bujnowski involved in our team. And in addition to Dory and Paul at Boston University, David Braverman, and at Wright State University, Mary Huber. Um, and without this team's real dedication to this project, the work wouldn't have been possible. So I want to start by just talking a little bit about the role of mental health in higher education. Um, it, it is a very prevalent issue for college students. Uh, the most recent studies of uh, actually the proportion of college students that have a diagnosable mental health disorder uh, runs, uh, estimates that to be about 27% of all U.S. college students. That's a fairly recent study, but it did uh, collect its data prior to the pandemic. And as we're all highly aware, um, the stresses of the pandemic have really increased our need to support students with mental health conditions. Um, in particular, we can see some of the evidence of the rise in demand for, for supports for these students from the Healthy Minds study, which is an annual study among a very large network of US colleges and universities. Um, and if we compare their findings from the 2018 academic year versus just this past winter spring semester of 21, we can see that there has been an increase in the in current severe depression from 18% to 22%, an increase in the current moderate to severe anxiety from 31 to 34 percent, a very large jump in uh, psychotropic medication use in the past 12 months from 24 to 35 percent. And the proportion of students that endorse a current need for help with mental health has increased from 49 to 53 percent. And perhaps most relevant to the study we're presenting to you today, 
that the proportion of students who report three or more days in the past four weeks in which their mental health hurt their academic performance, that has risen from 44 to 53%. So in general, the presence of mental health conditions among college students uh, is something that's fairly prevalent before the pandemic. It has certainly been heightened during the pandemic um, and, and will remain relevant for quite some time. We can also see that the impact of having a mental health condition um, can really impede a college student's uh, progress. So we know that 43% of first year college students who have mental health conditions report for themselves severe role impairment. We also know that high school students with mental health disabilities have the highest college dropout rate of any high school students with disabilities. The college students with mental health conditions have high rates of college disruption. And by that, I mean that they don't, they aren't, they are less able to continue through the eight semesters towards graduation or multiple more trimesters, that they tend to have breaks in their um, enrollment in college. We also know on the flip side of this that positive mental health is strongly correlated to academic success, retention in school, and ultimately vocational success and adult resiliency. And in the return on investment, which is sort of an economic concept that if you invest in the cost of college, that it pays back in terms of your lifetime earnings. So all of this is to say that, that supporting students, college students who have mental health conditions is very much um, in need uh, and something that uh, requires uh, attention and um, work at this point. And the study is housed within that, that need. Um, the past intervention also sits within a literature on supported education. Um, in reviewing that literature in 2017, Heather Ringeisen and her colleagues um, examined some of the, or most of the common elements of supported education. Um, and you can see from this description um, that, that it provides a fairly comprehensive, a rehabilitative lens on supporting students um, rather than a treatment lens for treatment of their mental health. So um, having specialized staff members that are oriented towards these four important objectives, supporting academic goal setting, building academic competencies, navigation of the college or university, and improving on their motivation. That there are one-on-one -on -one contacts, um, sometimes there are groups or workshops, and that they're focused on skill building for academic success. That there are a variety of activities that support education programs engage in to help students navigate the academic setting to coordinate between post-secondary education settings and mental health supports, to facilitate enrollment in college, to support the student in obtaining financial aid, securing additional educational accommodations, and providing information about rights and resources. And finally, that there's a provision of general supports and linkages with mental health counseling as appropriate, but mental health counseling or mental health treatment is not provided as a part, direct part of supported education. Um, and so the past intervention that we'll be telling you about um, sits squarely in this um, literature and in these rehabilitative efforts for college students. So the Peer Academic Supports for Success uh, project um, has been uh, funded and began in, twen in 2014. Um, what we'll be presenting in detail today is the pilot randomized control trial that compares past to enhanced services as usual, which is phase four of this research. It is the culmination of three prior phases of research. The past intervention and this research was designed and conducted in partnership with young adults with lived experience. In phase one, we conducted qualitative interviews of college students with mental health conditions faculty and staff of disability services and staff of counseling centers at three different universities to assess their experience and perspectives on the academic experiences of college students with mental health conditions. In phase two, we combine the results of phase one with a framework of two existing academic coaching supports for college students. One was a peer academic coaching model from Wright State University 
for students with autism spectrum disorders. And the second was a professional academic coaching model from Boston University for students with mental health conditions. This resulted in a, a very well specified peer academic coaching model for students with mental health conditions that included a coach manual, fidelity measures, and coach supervisor manual. In phase three, we alpha tested that model and the basic research methods in an open trial with 12 students. The intervention and the manuals were then refined as a result of those, that alpha testing, and we launched a pilot randomized control trial in the fall of 2018, and that's the study that we'll be focusing on today. Sorry. So one of the essential inputs from the young adults with lived experience was that academic supports would work best if they were provided by peers. In this case, peerness is defined by being a student at the university and not necessarily um, sharing direct lived experience. This, um, thus, uh, working from a peer academic coaching model, we then set to flesh out the logic model of using peers who are students who are coaching other students um, to help with the three primary outcomes that we were in, interested in improving, which it was, if you look in the lower right-hand corner here, improving their uh, grade point average, increasing their academic persistence, and increasing their retention rates. Um, and through reviewing the research literature, we identified or hypothesized that these five intermediate targets of the coaching should lead to those three improved outcomes. So improvement in executive functioning skills, in their resiliency, in their social support, in their academic self-efficacy, and in their self-determination. And then taking a step back from that in the construction of this logic model then was, what are the specific activities that coaches would do that would have an impact on these, these intermediate targets. And what you see listed here are a list of 17 coach activities. And in the parentheses following each one is the intermediate target that that activity would then, uh, are, is then designed to impact. Um, and with that in mind then, we will proceed with Paul Churchia uh, telling us in more detail about the past model. Thanks, Marianne, for going through all that, too. And it's so helpful to see some of the data and the facts, too, and just kind of recognizing the importance and the need to support students in higher education uh, that are living with a mental health condition on campus. So uh, thank you all for joining, too. I really appreciate the time. Again, my name is Paul Churchia. Uh, by training, I'm a licensed mental health counselor, but I work uh, at Boston University's Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation as the co-director of our college mental health education programs. And I also supervise all of the past coaches within this program. So what I was hoping to do uh, was just to kind of outline a little bit more in depth about what we actually do in coaching and even show some of those activities that are actually happening uh, between the coach and the student. And certainly if you have questions or anything like that pops up, feel free to pop that into the Q and A and I'm happy to address that right on the spot too. Uh, so, Marianne, if you don't mind, we'll kind of we'll get into it a little bit here and go to the next slide. So um, this is kind of a quick look at what actually is uh, peer academic coaching. Uh, on the left hand side here, you'll see kind of our principles of coaching. So wellness oriented, really, when we're working with students, a lot of times it focuses on, on academics. They're all full time students. But we're really trying to take a broader look here and kind of focus on different domains of their well-being because we know that uh, they tend to all be intertwined. So we're not just focusing on academics, but rather a student's social well-being, a student's emotional and physical and environmental well-being too. And the coaches are well-trained to kind of focus on different areas, refer to resources as needed, uh, recognizing that when some of those other domains are not given as much attention, um, their academic ability and uh, ability to succeed and do well tend to tend to be intertwined there as well. Uh, we're always person centered or kind of student focused. They're kind of at the at the heart of what the work is being done. The student brings in the agenda and we kind of respond to that uh, as needed. 
Um, it's relationship focused. I really uh, have the coaches focus on building trust and rapport and important relationship with that student as that tends to lead to kind of the most success uh, within the program as well. Uh, we always focus on strength space too, what's going well for the student, how we can kind of build and adapt from there too, as opposed to focusing on uh, the negativity or the challenges that a student might be going through. Coaching is voluntary as well. Students can, can leave the uh, program at any time. And I always kind of say that, that coaching is active, coaching is doing, coaching is not just talking back and forth for an hour, uh, but rather it's, it's interactive, it's solution focused, it's goal driven. Uh, coaching is doing is what I always kind of tell our, our coaches to be thinking about. And some of the areas that we're kind of targeting, a lot of students are looking for help uh, in the executive functioning area, memory and processing speed, but also kind of areas like, you know, time management, organization and different aspects like that. Resiliency, um, kind of being able to overcome challenges and emotional agility, kind of reframing um, some negative experiences that might come up in different ways and, and ways to kind of cope with with the inevitable stress that comes with, with being a student right now, especially now and at a school like Boston University. A lot of students join this program because they're lonely, they're isolated, and that's been more enhanced in the past couple of years as well. So making sure the students connected to social supports is a big target of our coaching and, and something that students are looking for. Uh, academic self-efficacy, just the belief that students can do it. Again, that kind of comes with overcoming challenges and believing in themselves that they can do well, not only academically, but again, in different areas of, of well-being at school. Self-determination, their kind of ability to kind of navigate their own life and their schedule and being a student, a full-time student. And, and again, Marianne, you alluded to this as well, but you know, the ultimate, ultimate goal with, with our coaching and the support we're giving is to allow the students to have the skills and supports uh, in order to, to graduate eventually. All right, so that kind of is what peer academic coaching is. Um, a quick look at kind of who our peer coaches are. Uh, they are anywhere between 18 to 25 years old. Primarily they're juniors and seniors at the university. Uh, they've kind of have a, a proven track record that they can be academically successful and are kind of really thriving on campus. They're, they're well-versed in, in BU and the resources on campus and be able to kind of provide some of that skill building and, and practicality to other students as well. And many of our coaches too have had some type of lived experience uh, with a mental health condition, not required, but, but oftentimes and certainly historically have seen this that, that students that have some type of, of lived experience tend to be the best coaches too. I think students that can have that empathy and compassion to what other students are going through really tend to get it. Um, and they're kind of a coach for the right reason. I've seen in the past too, that uh, even coaches that look incredible on paper, um, sometimes uh, you kind of recognize that maybe they're there for a resume builder and kind of that experience in coaches that might have a little bit less experience, but more experience within the lived, uh, lived experience realm uh, tend, to be, tend to be more effective too. So that's certainly something that I kind of look out for. Uh, but empathy and compassion and, and building that trust and rapport and that relationship with the student usually leads to a successful uh, coach and student pairing. All right, so that's kind of who our, our peer coaches are and their qualifications. Um, so up here now on the screen, you're going to see some of our, our past core competencies. Um, so really what we were addressing were some inter intermediate targets of coaching, and really it resulted in identifying some core competencies to help students succeed. Um, so our core competencies are structure, uh, meaning like, and, and this happens a lot within coaching, um, where coaches might help a student calendar to make a schedule, to set goals, to do some time management, to really bring structure and routine uh, to students' lives and uh, on campus too. And, and, and a lot of times, uh, focus is, is spent on that too. So structure is a big one. Technology, this is where using different forms of technology, whether it be apps around uh, well-being, around breathing, around meditation, or around uh, academic skills too, to allow students to set the most for success. So that's technology. We have emotional agility. Um, this is really the kind of the coaches reframing and responding to experience um, that students might perceive as negative too, which a lot of times students just need someone to kind of bounce those thoughts and experiences off of, and coaches are well-trained and have the ability to do that. Advocacy, we see this all the time. 
uh, where this comes up in coaching as like role plays or emailing drafts to emailing email drafts to professors or advisors and really effectively communicating and, and having a student's voice be heard or kind of speaking up if any challenge or something has come up. Um, but that, that has been a, a big piece too. And it's something that can be collaborative between the coach and the student, you know, to draft that email together to, to role play what the situation might look for, might look like uh, as well. That's advocacy. And then resiliency, um, really identifying potential solutions to challenges uh, that have come up or that might come up and really kind of developing a, a self-care routine and practices for students along the way too. So these are our, our, our five kind of core competencies that come up uh, and we really kind of target within uh, peer coaching. Um, so I want to get into kind of a little bit of, of what activities or what things might actually be happening within coaching. Uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll use or I encourage coaches to use SAMHSA's eight domains of, of wellness as a way to kind of get to know a student, as a way to gather information, as a way to set some goals and really kind of build some, some rapport uh, with a student right off the bat. So you'll see um, up here, we have the eight domains of, of wellness. You'll see I only have five listed there, primarily because these are the five that the students and the coaches tend to focus on as well. And, and Marianne, I think if you click through, you might see some examples of some of these kind of pop up too. So, so the domains of well-being would be something that I encourage a coach to kind of work through, right? We're not just focusing on ac academics, but rather let's kind of look at a, a holistic view of the student and really kind of find some areas where you can thrive or maybe some areas that might need a little bit more attention. So when a, when a coach is going to work through like tell me how you're doing emotionally, tell me how you do or stay well emotionally. Um, a situation that might come up could be a recent breakup or kind of go into therapy weekly. So we're identifying how do you stay well emotionally? What are some areas that might come up that might need a little bit of attention on the emotional well-being side too? And we can kind of, again, use this information to learn more about the student, to build rapport, and then take this information to set goals. So you'll see up there, we have social opportunities. Again, a lot of students are looking for social connections and are lonely. That's why they tell me they're joining the program. They're lonely. And the coach, what the coach does is get them connected to resources. And it's not just saying you should check out, you know, book club, or you should go, you know, ask your coworkers or our classmates, maybe out to dinner or something like that, but rather they do it together. They research the club. The coach walks down to the club with the student, make sure that they're really kind of, they have that follow through and they have that collaborative point of accountability too. Um, they'll, you know, help the students text their friends or text a coworker, set up kind of a social meeting too, right there in the moment. And that's the doing and the collaborativeness of the coaching. Some financial areas of well-being, you know, might be around student loans and navigating financial assistance, getting them connected to that office, helping them with a the budget. We see a lot of, of area around for physical well-being, uh, just Going into the uh, fit rec here at BU, if you're a new student, can be overwhelming in itself. It's a massive place, not quite sure how to do it. Coaches and students will go together. They don't even have to work out together, but sometimes just walking in that door, starting a routine can be really helpful and then kind of building that into their, their structure as well, um, their weekly structure too. So some physical well-being, occupational, whether it's finding a, a job on campus or looking for an internship or kind of navigating what am I going to do with my major? How does that play into my career? Setting up an appointment uh, with a vocational counselor here on campus or something like that, too. These are all areas that we're focusing on just beyond academics, too, to really allow the student to thrive in different areas and to recognize that they have skills and strengths in some of these areas. And also that maybe they need to spend a little bit more time or attention on some, some areas, too. And again, we can use this information uh, for a lot of different areas. So that's one activity that you might uh, that the coach might do with the student. Again, it's always kind of dependent upon what the student's looking for, but I really love that one and coaches have found that um, helpful right off the bat. So uh, again, uh, I've said it and I, I say it to my coaches all the time, coaching is doing. It is not just talking about back and forth. It's not creating a long to-do list. I always say students should have things crossed off their to-do list, to list when you've finished coaching as opposed to having things added on. So what I like to do is kind of say, here's a menu. These are potential areas that you can be doing in coaching. And Marianne, thanks for kind of going through, seeing the menu build. Um, these are just some examples. The list can go on and on. Again, it's dependent upon what the student is looking for. 
but sending emails, right? Like emailing the professor, I overslept, I missed class. So sorry, can I come to office hours? Um, helping the student go to office hours, scheduling that appointment, walking them down there to make sure it happens. Time management, social, ac social activities. Um, you'll see some technology on there, exploring wellness apps, reframing, they're responding and kind of understanding the negative experiences. Again, coaches are, are not the student's therapist, but they're well-trained to empathize and listen and respond. You don't need to be a therapist to do that. I mean, a lot of times that's what students are looking for is just to be heard and validated. And who better to do that than a student at BU that's kind of maybe gone through some similar experiences too. Um, coping techniques are on here. Studying, just collaboratively studying together is a great way to do it. Um, even if the student studies independently and the coach is right there next to them, check in every 15, 20 minutes, do some quizzing, do some kind of study techniques that way. Uh, providing accountability, lifestyle situations, helping with class registration and advising, uh, goal setting, journaling, career goals. Again, you'll see kind of how broad peer coaching is. And I, what I really like to do is have the coaches create a menu for the student and show them that these are all areas that we can potentially focus on. These are areas that I want you to know if it comes up or if you're interested in it, these are areas that we can be looking at. It doesn't just have to always be academics. And more often than not, you'll see kind of the list of the students, what they want to work on growing and being more in depth and broad, All right? So this is just kind of a menu of, and I asked the coaches to really kind of outline this to the students right up front uh, so that students know how in depth coaching can be. So we talked about kind of gathering information from the student through the domains of wellness. I just kind of mentioned on that, um, on that menu, you saw goal setting. Goal setting is a huge piece of what we do within the coaching process. Um, this is kind of a, a method that I encourage coaches to share with students. So we're not just setting goals, but we're strategically setting goals. And one of the ways to do that, many of you might've heard of this, it's a SMART goal method. Um, so the SMART goal method uh, is really kind of a strategic, strategic way to do that. If we have a vague goal, it tends to kind of get lost in the shuffle. Um, so SMART goals, meaning that making sure that your goals have specifics in them, making sure that there's a quantifiable piece to your goal that you can measure it, making sure that the goal is achievable and that this can actually happen. We're not setting ourselves up for failure, making sure the goals are relevant, that they align with what the student is looking to do and, and setting some type of deadline on there tends to make these goals come to life and tends to make them collaborative so that the coach can support on that. I love this worksheet. I encourage coaches to use this worksheet with students identify potential obstacles that could come up, identify potential solutions, and then take that draft goal, that vague goal. And after you've gone through kind of the acronym of the SMART goal, um, you can kind of rewrite the final goal too. It's a way to set students up for uh, success as, as well. So SMART goal setting, goal setting, this comes up a lot. And this is one way that a coach might do it with a student and also kind of give them the tool and the strategy to use this as a goal setting technique. I saw um, did a question come in, D? I think you just mentioned maybe we got a a question on the chat. Sue, Their hand Sue, raised. Sue Conley has her hand raised. Um, let me see if I can allow her to talk. Give me one sec. And if you can't, Sue, you're welcome to pop your question into the to the Q and A too, and I'm happy to address it on the spot too. Would love to keep this interactive. Um, and answer your questions if needed. So you should be able to unmute yourself now. I just have a daughter going through some of this stuff right now. She was um, great in her class in college. She had to do online during COVID at a um, community college before going to our large university in Michigan. And she is struggling right now as a junior with um, unwanted thoughts that are in getting involved with not, her not getting to get her schoolwork done like she likes. And she's always been a perfectionist. So she's really struggling, but I'm going through a lot of these things with her. And she has roommates she can reach out to. Um, I've also suggested counseling through the college. And she's researching that as well. So we're looking into this, but it's a serious thing. It really is. Yeah. Thank you, Sue, for sharing that. It sounds like you can personally connect to this and kind of the yeah. need for, for programming like this. Um, yes. Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm happy to talk to you after too, if that's helpful, just to share some other resources or strategize around that. But um, Sue, I, I think what you're kind of pointing out too is you can kind of see the need yes. um, for this and the effectiveness of it too. Definitely, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And again, if others have questions, feel free to throw them in the Q&A and I'm happy to address it on the spot. Um, all right, so this was our SMART goal. It's just kind of one strategy, another activity that you might see happening within coaching. And Marianne, I think we can move past it. Yes, great. So um, we do some mapping. If, if you have you know are familiar with kind of mapping and how that can be helpful to an interactive process between a coach and a student. And one of the most common maps and most effective maps that I, I have coaches do with their students is a support map. Um, right off the bat, this is a great way to kind of learn a little bit more about the student, who they have in their life, who are supports. It also allows the coach to kind of recognize, you know, if you're feeling a certain way, you've told me that this person is in your life. You've told me that this person is helpful. Maybe this is someone that we should connect with right now or send a text to and make sure that they're, you know, you're talking to them and using them. It's also something that coaches can always kind of come back to and say, I know that you have these people in your life too, especially if a student's going through something challenging, struggling a little bit. Um, and when students oftentimes they join the program because they're lonely or feel isolated, this sometimes helps kind of make their support and kind of recognize that they do have other people too. Um, and when you put it on paper and you kind of map it out, I, I do really think it kind of makes it, it come alive a little bit more and makes it real. And again, you can kind of keep this too. So um, this is a, a basic support map. You can do maps around anything. It's a great interactive collaborative strategy for a coach to be doing when they're working on something together too, meaning that the coach is kind of talking, tell me who's in your support system. Tell me who's helpful. Tell me who isn't helpful. Tell me what strategies or activities you do. Uh, and the coach kind of does the drawing and the student does the talking. It's a very interactive way and helpful to build rapport and kind of takes pressure off the coach. So you're not just staring back and forth at each other, um, but rather focusing on something else too. So this is just kind of an example that this student, you know, has a supportive roommate. They have a therapist, they have the gym. They know that's helpful. They have their pet. They have art as an activity, family that's supportive and a partner as well. So when the coach might be hearing some things throughout the semester, they can point back to this. You know, I know you have a helpful roommate. I know you have a therapist. This might be helpful to bring into your therapy session. I know the gym has always been helpful for you in the past. You told me, right? We put it on paper. Would it be helpful to maybe try going to the gym later today? I can come with you. I can meet you there. You know, send me a picture of the, of the bike or the treadmill or something like that for accountability. That's really important to point out too, that while coaches and students typically meet, you know, once a week for at least an hour, there's continuity in your communication between the coach and the student to really make sure that the support is there, that accountability is there, that follow-up on goals can be there too. And that really helps build the relationship as well. All right, so this is our support map, just an example of a potential map um, that we might be doing. And Marianne, we can go to the next slide if that's all right. Yes. Um, so we have manuals too. We have manuals that uh, help guide our coaches and kind of really outline uh, what's going on in coaching, what can be used in coaching. Um, you'll see on kind of the right-hand side, that's what it looks like back in 2018, 2019. We have online copies, we have binded copies, and coaches really kind of use this as their guide throughout training, throughout the semester to use back to and refer to um, when things might come up in the moment. So uh, we developed uh, the manual and included information about mental health conditions and its impact on academics, really just more from an educational standpoint for our coaches, uh, the basics of peer support and coaching and what that is, strategies to work on with students, uh, self-care topics, routine, routine, specific topics on, you know, exercises like I showed you with the support maps and the goal setting and addressing some of the core competencies that I mentioned with that STEER acronym um, and some logistics that come with it too. So this is every coach gets this at the beginning um, of their training in the beginning of the semester. They use it really as a guide and a referral source, but then obviously they use me as their supervisor uh, throughout the entire year. And they also use each other uh, as coaches to kind of support each other through the process and kind of bounce some ideas and referral uh, sources off that too. All right. So we do have it manualized in the process. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is Dory. Uh, we have had two questions come in and I, the manual might be a good place to take a break and respond to these two questions since 
it provides an overview of the program. Um, and the two questions were similar. One was, how could we get our local colleges to employ the PASS program? And drilling down a little bit further, kind of where would this program and these manuals sit? Um, someone wrote that they work for disability services and their focus tends to be and needs to be on providing access. So where do you think this program would be best housed? Um, and they would appreciate your thoughts. Yeah, I, I, think, it I think it depends, Dory. Um, at, at BU, you know, where, where I work and where Dory works too is the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation. So we're, we're separate from um, the main behavioral medicine or the main counseling office too. However, we really try to work collaboratively with them and with the disability services office too, because we know that, that those offices are seeing the students um, and kind of catching those students can then use us as a referral source to help coach them through the peer coach process too. I do want to make it clear too that most students that join this program, it's highly encouraged that they're seeing a weekly counselor or therapist um, as well. So we're not replacing that, but rather we're a supplement or kind of a complement um, to that process as well. So I think we're in a unique situation here at Boston University where it lives at the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation, but I can certainly see this program living within disability services, uh, living within uh, the counseling office, um, any, anywhere like that too. And, and the manuals um, we kind of use and developed here, but can certainly we can um, train and kind of talk more about what that can look like as well. And um, you know, other offices that might be able to, to use them. Okay, so that was, that's a, we've had two more questions I think you're probably going to get to about when will the coaching manuals be shareable, and then um, what we're paying the coaches. Okay, um, let's move to the next slide, and I think I can get a couple of those questions in there, and if I don't, we'll circle back to it. Um, so here's just kind of what the structure of the peer coaching process looks like. Uh, roughly around like 12 hours of training um, through like, I, I'll usually do kind of like a couple of webinars myself before the semester even starts, just so when students come here for training, they have a little bit of a base knowledge, but then I'll do extensive in-person training at the start of the semester before any coaches are ever paired with students. That's really an opportunity for us to go through the manual, to go through safety and crisis procedures, um, to go through what coaching, peer coaching is and what peer coaching is not. Um, and then after those trainings at the beginning of the semester, we meet, or I meet each week uh, with every coach in group supervision. Um, so every week we get together and kind of figure out kind of what's gone well, what's not going well. It's not a place where we bring any student contact or information in, but rather what's going well or what's been a challenge for the coach. And then we collaborate on that. And I continue to kind of build in skills and strategies throughout the year to kind of continue to build the coach's tool belt. Um, so weekly group supervision, and then I do individual super, supervision as needed, where coaches reach out to me on an as needed basis. And I can talk to them one-on-one -on -one about what's going on with their student. And then certainly bring some of that content into our group supervision as well. Um, Coaching is usually once or twice a week, depending on what the student is looking for. So each coach will meet with their student once or twice a week. Uh, we say up to four hours a week with each student. Usually it's around an hour to an hour and a half, kind of depending on the time of year, what, I, what we've historically seen. Um, and then a, a kind of a, a coaching session there, kind of logistically what it can look like, building rapport, be a human, being a, be a student being first and connect and talk and be a young adult. Um, before you kind of go into goal setting and things like that. Any housekeeping items, here's what we talked about last week. Here's what you said, making sure that we kind of really set our agenda, discuss it, um, and then take action. We're not just kind of talking back and forth, but here's what you said you wanted to work on. Here's what's a priority. Here's what we kind of need to do to make that happen. And then you do it within coaching. Uh, so anything that can be done in coaching or started in coaching happens in coaching. And then kind of review the task for the week. Here's what you have left. Here's what maybe I can do for you too, if that would be helpful. We can check in with it later this week. I can text you um, and then kind of wrapping up and looking ahead to the final week um, as well. Um, the coaches are paid. Um, so they are paid. Uh, it's usually around like four to five hours a week, depending on how many students that they meet with. The, the actual figure on what they're paid escapes me at this moment, but it's somewhere you know above minimum wage somewhere around there and 
Um, I think it is helpful to, to pay the coaches too. It makes it a, a paying job and really get, you know, a lot of buy-in and commitment um, on that end as well. Did I miss anything there, Dory, on the, on the question? Just want to make sure I didn't skip That's, over anything. Um, no, we had another question come in that's it's kind of like a little case study for, for you to respond to. Um, someone wrote in uh, that um, what, what would you do um, or what is your suggestion for the coaches when a student receives an extenuating circumstance that states their grades won't be in jeopardy because of that circumstance, but the school doesn't follow through with it? It, um, it sounds like a lot of silos. Uh, that when the different systems don't work together, disability services isn't talking to advising, advising doesn't talk to financial aid, and then students are getting all different types of responses, which clearly causes a lot of stress. How might yeah. the past program respond to that, Paul? Yeah, and I think that's really where coaches can be really, really helpful, either to say, um, I've heard of this or I've experienced something similar, and here's so you need to... Uh, email or reach out to or call and we can do that right now we're going to draft that email together why don't you copy you know the dean of students or your advisor on this to make sure that we're having open and collaborative communication and here's what i might say here's how you can draft it the coach and the student draft that together send it off um, and then i would say have the coach can you follow up with me if you don't hear it in a couple of days to make sure that we can follow back up and make sure that you're kind of talking to the necessary people and everyone's in kind of open communication about that. If you're a first or second year student, um, you know, specifically at a big school like BU, those offices and different resources and supports, as many as and robust as they can be, can be really, really hard um, to navigate. Um, so the, the coach is going to help collaboratively uh, answer, you know, help get that student connected to resources and supports too. Um, I'm seeing on here as well, how do you recruit your coaches? Uh, often, oftentimes what I'll do, um, if the current coaches know people or say, you know what this role is better than anyone and you have someone that you think would be um, helpful, have them reach out to me and I give them a little interview. I reach out to also um, different advisors or kind of people that work with different populations on campus. And I really try and diversify it too. what offices I'm reaching out to to recruit students from to just say, we have this open position. If you had anyone that you think would be helpful or you know of someone that you think would be good at it, please send them my way. Um, and then I also just post on the Boston University job board as well, where I'll get a lot of inquiries from that as well. But uh, each year I get probably 50 inquiries for this job. And usually we have, you know, six or seven positions open, depending, depending upon who's coming back. And there's also uh, two other comments and or a question and a comment. Uh, Valerie Melroy is sharing a great resource in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. They have a program called College Plus, which has been around for, it looks like for 15 years. Uh, it's a peer support program for students who go to Bucks County Community College. They have great outcomes. She uh, provides a link for people who are interested and want more information. And then um, we have a question about is administration on board with this and how is it funded through a college or a grant? Um, Marianne did uh, share that this right now is being funded through a federal grant. Um, and so the administration is supportive of us uh, using um, people and resources to, um, to put this grant into action on our campus as well as at UMass Boston. Um, and she st st states, we have a very similar program at my college utilizing peers. Some are grad students and some are at the School of Social Work interns. Thanks, Dory. Thanks for those questions too. I did see, um, it looked like Sin Coons, you asked, uh, can you share the coaching manual? Um, Marianne, I might bat that to you on timing and kind of what that would look like or sharing that or resources too about sharing the coaching manual. Yeah, I, I guess I would suggest at this point, if you are interested in seeing the coaching manual, um, that, that you get in touch <clears throat> with us about it. We're in the process right now of offering pass uh, at the first university that is not Boston University where it was developed. And in doing that, we've been able to uh, make sure that the manual <clears throat> applies pretty well someplace other than where it was developed, that a supervisor can be somebody other than Paul. So there's a supervisor manual um, and putting some supports around how to 
help the pass intervention be offered someplace that's not um, at Boston University. Um, so I would say that the, the materials are uh, largely developed. Um, and I think Paul and Dory would probably be interested in having a conversation with folks who are interested in offering this at their university. However, one of the reasons of, of having this um, webinar was to share the research findings as they are right now. Um, and uh, I would say that they're encouraging, but we would not yet put this forth as an evidence-based practice. The current trial that is underway um, is a larger trial. And at the, at the end of conducting that, I think we'll be in a better position to say whether this is an evidence-based practice or not. So if that's important to your thinking about whether you wanna offer that or not, we still have another about year and a half of data collection to go before we'd be able to provide that definitive answer. How's that sound, Paul? That sounded great. Thank you, Marianne. <laughs> okay. um, just real quick too, someone asked how many uh, students each coach works with. Dory, you answered on the chat, but yeah, generally around one to three, anything more than three, I, I think is too much um, just because, you know, coaches are full-time students too and have a lot on their plate, but usually around you know, one to three students kind of depending upon where they are. And we usually have around um, about seven coaches um, and we try and recruit, I think we're trying to recruit 32 students um, this, this year as well. And we've done in the past too. Um, all right, so that's a little bit kind of the process and what, what peer coaching looks like. And again, I'm happy to collaborate offline as well about the process and, and kind of what coaching from a supervision standpoint looks like. Okay, and I'll take it forward with talking about uh, describing the actual study to uh, examine preliminarily um, how uh, effective or how efficacious a uh, pass is. So let me describe that to you. And then we'll have time um, uh, at the end of this, as well as if you have questions as we move along, um, we can certainly, now I'll say I'm not as good as Paul is at monitoring the Q&A live. Um, so Dory, I'll, I'll uh, rely on you if you'd let me know if there's a question that comes up as we're going along. And I'd be happy to answer those questions as we go. So let me talk a little bit about the methods of this pilot randomized control trial. So as we've been describing, this has taken place at Boston University, um, which is a large private university in the Northeast. It has a fairly high academic admission standards. And um, these, uh, the students there are overwhelmingly full-time students that, who are also living on campus. Now, the study started in the fall of 2018. We had at that point funding for one academic year. Uh, in the summer of 2019, so the following summer, we found funding for a second academic year to offer it again uh, as, as a piece of research. So where we were recruiting um, individuals into the study and randomizing them to receive pass or a control condition. Um, this ended up proving to be extremely beneficial as in, as we all know, in the spring of 2020 um, with the onset of the pandemic, um, we were able to rapidly uh, consider how we could offer, continue to offer PASS uh, as a support to students, but make it also safe. And so it moved to remote capacities, as well as being able to adapt our research and data collection into uh, remote capacities. So um, that ended up being, as, as we've all been in life, a flexible approach to um, wanting to continue to study and offer the intervention. Um, and we started that uh, in the spring of 2020. So the study that we're presenting today is based on acad two academic years, 2018 and 19, and 2019 and 20. So student participants were traditionally aged college students who had completed less than half of their credits towards graduation, who had mental health conditions that impacted their academic participation or performance. That is basically the criteria for the students in the study. Um, we recruited individuals through flyers that uh, were posted on Facebook, as well as being um, uh, physically available to various programs and um, stuck in various places on campus. Uh, coaches were very active in getting out and uh, posting flyers. Um, as well as giving presentations to various groups. The flyer itself provided a link to a brief initial screening web survey 
and that assessed the student status at the university. So they needed to be a student, assess their age, um, assess uh, where they were in their uh, progression through the university, and then asked about a self-report of having been diagnosed with a mental health condition. Um, we asked specifically if they'd ever been diagnosed by uh, any kind of professional as having schizophrenia or any other psychotic disorders, but an anxiety disorder, any kind of mood disorder, any kind of eating disorder, or any kind of attention deficit or disruptive behavior disorders. So if the student indicated that they had been diagnosed with one of those conditions and they were a student on the campus um, as an undergraduate um, and they were under age 25, but over age 17, um, they then uh, were invited to provide their contact information so that we could conduct a more in-depth screen. So um, we provided them a choice of whether they would like the research team member to interview them to conduct that screen or if they would like to do a self-administered web survey. And in that screen, we conducted the uh, Kessler-6, the K-6, um, which identifies both the likely, uh, likely presence of a serious mental illness and or clinical need um, and a questionnaire about their recent history of educational barriers that were uh, caused by their mental health condition. And in general, a combination of a positive K-6, which was having a score of five or greater and reporting educational barriers essentially uh, deemed the student then as eligible for the study. Um, and this diagram then shows the flow of recruitment. So we had 190 individuals who started the preliminary screen. 29 of them didn't complete, complete the preliminary screen, but 161 did complete that preliminary screen. And of those, 36 were not eligible based on that preliminary screen. Um, another 44 then did not complete the final screen. 81 did complete the final screen. Only five of them were found not eligible. Four were eligible, but then declined to participate further in the study. And so 72 were eligible and were randomized to receive either pass or the control condition. Marianne? Yes. Um, we had a question come in that uh, around demographics that I think is important to respond to. Um, as we've experienced the frustration as well. Um, someone writes they're a woman of color and they see this more times than not, that black and brown populations are underserved and I get it, they don't come out. There is stigma. How do you stop the stigma? I'm frustrated because I've lived experience and I'm a functioning adult, but black and brown people are afraid to self-identify. I know my daughter is going through the very same thing right now. Yeah, it, it is a very difficult um, issue that, that we have um, worked particularly hard in the, in the larger trial that we're um, underway with right now in trying to ensure that we're able to um, recruit uh, black and brown people um, as well into the study. Uh, and um, we have had some success with that sometimes. Um, so when one does recruitment, there isn't a huge platform from which to address stigma per se. Um, the recruitment strategies have been to try to ensure that um, organizations that uh, provide supports to black and brown students in particular are aware of the study and can make their students aware of the study. Um, the only way to get past services, I should say, at this time is through entering the research. And so people can encourage a student to um, participate in the research and that is the avenue through which to uh, gain access to PASS. Um, so part of the strategy has been to go to those organizations, to engage those organizations in conversations about how could this be um, communicated to students as an opportunity and uh, the, the sort of the benefits potentially of it. Um, be clear and um, sort of communicated in, in a friendly way um, and, a, and a, a way that um, uh, is engaging. Um, we've also uh, had the coaches um, on each of the campuses um, develop videos. Uh, we didn't for this pilot study, 
uh, actually the question that you're raising came up as an issue during the pilot study about whether we were sufficiently engaging um, uh, diverse, uh, diversity of students in, in the research and in the past intervention. Um, and uh, one approach has been for the, the coaches who actually, the coaches are diverse, um, to produce videos of themselves talking about the intervention in the study, um, which we don't have data on per se how effective that is, but um, it is an attempt to um, have students see a coach who is a person of color. Um, uh, we also struggle to recruit men, uh, quite honestly, and so to see male coaches as uh, talking positively about the opportunities that, that students would have. Um, and so that, those have been some of our strategies. Um, but I think the, the question about trying to help students of color who struggle with mental health to feel like they, they can access supports and services is, is a very real one. Um, and uh, I'm afraid it goes well beyond um, our capacities in, in this particular webinar. Um, Dory or Paul, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? Um, I would just add uh, that, you know, I think we have made intentional outreach to at our university, we have um, a whole uh, group of people that deal, um, support what we call college access programs for underserved students, um, black and brown, uh, you know, first generation. Um, and we have worked closely with them to make sure they know about this resource. Um, because as it's part of a grant right now, it's also free uh, for students on campus. Um, so um, we try to we try to find every kind of personal way of getting the word out because I think that we found has worked better than um, dealing just with you know flyers and social media, but making connections with people on campus um, who can reach these students. Thanks, Joy. So let me tell you a little bit about the screening results among those who then were eligible for the study to give you sort of a, a, a feel for um, sort of the, the, the characteristics of their mental health and their struggles with education um, that got them into the study. So with looking at the K-6, um, the 54% met the higher cutoff of the K-6, which is having a score of greater than or equal to 13, which is actually used in a variety of of uh, national studies as a marker for the likely presence of a severe mental illness. Um, so these were students that were, uh, were uh, really struggling with, with their mental health um, and uh, were highly um, uh, likely to have, um, I would say, uh, challenges to their educational progress. And they also then um, indicated on the educational barriers questionnaire that they had significant um, barriers that they felt were caused by their mental health. And so the basic question there was thinking about your most recent academic year. So recognizing that many of these um, individuals were freshmen, so they'd never been in college before. So we wanted to ask about their experience, their most recent, which would, for them would have been high school. Have you had difficulty with any of the following related to your academics? And so some of these questions were about managing academic stress or attending class and the possible score that they could have on having had um, educational barriers was 18 to 72. And the, the average for the group was um, 48.5. Um, and they typically had somewhere between little to some difficulty, the average score was 2.7. And the average number of items with some or a lot of, with some or a lot of difficulty was 10 and a half out of a possible 18 items. So I would say that, that these were individuals who both were struggling with their mental health and had experienced academic barriers um, uh, that were caused by their mental health that would, we felt would potentially benefit from the past intervention. So just to describe essentially what the data collection looked like then was that for students that were enrolled in the study, they completed a baseline survey um, that their randomization occurred after the baseline survey, um, and they were then randomized to uh, receiving a pass or our control condition, which was to 
uh, essentially provide them a consultation period uh, or session in which they expressed a, a desire for more information about a variety of resources on campus. They had been provided a list and asked which of these um, they might be interested in or things that we're struggling with, in which case our resource specialist could suggest certain um, resources for them. And then they had access to all of the resources on campus. So that in essence was our control condition. Um, they completed end of semester surveys at, at the end of the subsequent two semesters. So if they enrolled at the beginning, let's say of the fall semester, they completed a, a, a survey at the end of that fall semester. And then again, at the end of the spring semester, we also gathered their transcripts and we asked them to complete a peer coach assessment each semester about the activities that they did with their coach. The peer coach assessment was, a, was part of our fidelity measure. Peer coaches were also considered to be research participants because they were providing data about their activities and they provided the self-assessment. So they kept weekly logs of the time, the student goals that they, they, they were addressing and the activities that they completed and they completed a self-assessment. And finally, we had access to supervisory notes. Okay. So the measures that we assessed were mapped onto those five basic intermediate goals of the past intervention, the executive function skills, resilience, social support, self-efficacy, and self-determination. Then for each of those, uh, outcomes, we then identified a measurement tool that had good psychometric properties applied to college students um, and uh, had uh, reasonable data that uh, 18 to 25 year olds would be um, uh, essentially reporting on relevant um, things for themselves. So you can see that there are a variety of measures for each of these. Um, and if you're interested in um, getting a copy of this, we can certainly um, share that. And then for our ultimate goals of, uh, for this study, for the pilot, um, we could look at their grade point average um, and whether they had continuous enrollment um, in, during the period of the, of the study. Um, and we used transcripts for those data points. So let me give you the highlights of the results of uh, the data collection. So we had participant characteristics um, and um, these are organized to show you the, the variables in the left-hand column, the value for the total sample in the next column uh, to the column to the right of that, the, the values for the, those in the past condition and then those in the control condition. Um, and I will start off by saying the only variable in which there was a significant difference between the pass and the control condition actually ended up being the proportion who reported being Latinx. Um, and we have actually corrected for that um, disproportionality in our current study by ensuring that that's one of the variables that is included in our randomization scheme. Um, we weren't expecting to see uh, that that just that a, a randomization would have taken care of it, but it in fact did not. So what you can see then is that uh, the the sample is overwhelmingly fem of female students, um, and as I mentioned briefly, um, part of uh, our current efforts are to try to have more success in recruiting males. Um, that we. Uh, that about half of the students or less than half of the students report uh, having uh, being of a uh, heterosexual orientation, that um, the majority of the students were white, 5.6% um, were black. That is actually consistent with the proportion of black students on this particular campus. So it's representative of the campus. Um, we have a very small portion who are American Indian or Alaska Native a substantial portion who are Asian and a small um, proportion who report being uh, multiracial. If we then look at their uh, college status, uh, the vast majority of these students are full-time students taking four to six courses at the time of their enrollment. Um, most of them were freshmen, another chunk of them were sophomores, 
And um, we did have some who were more than sophomores or self-reported as being more than sophomores. And again, kind of typical of this campus, a large portion of them were living on campus when they were enrolled. And then looking at some of their mental health characteristics. So consistent with this being a group that had significant mental health conditions, um, more than 80% of them had received mental health treatment in the past. Uh, more than half of them were currently receiving mental health treatment when they enrolled in the study. Um, about 44% of them were currently taking psychotropic medication. And then uh, the nature of the mental health treatment that they had received most recently was primarily outpatient individual psychotherapy with uh, the next category most commonly being seeing a psychiatrist for medication purposes. That gives you a, a sense of the sample. Okay. So then looking at our analyses of, of intermediate and ultimate outcomes, um, in this presentation, we're still working on analyzing these data and we're, we're focusing on the outcomes for this, where we also have fidelity data um, that uh, we haven't completed um, our analysis of. Uh, so we won't be sharing those at this, at this point, but our first interest was in taking a look to see what their intermediate and ultimate outcomes looked like. And so the analyses we'll present are based on those with two follow-up data time points. Um, as I described, we uh, collected data at the end of their first semester and then at the end of their second semester after enrolling in the study. Um, we had uh, only 45 of the 72 had both follow-up time points. Um, and uh, what we found was, we, as I described, we found funding the year after we started the project that we didn't know what that we had in the first year. And unfortunately that set up a situation where we had recruited about 19 students in the spring of the first year that at the time of their recruitment, we didn't know that we'd be able to do follow-up after that year. And um, a, a large portion of them, 12 of them declined to continue in the study. Um, and, and for some of those, for half of those that was continuing to get past coaching. Um, and so we had a large number of those who did not have uh, both follow-up data points. Um, and so it turned out that 75% uh, of those who were not in that particular group who'd been recruited in the spring of uh, 2019 actually did provide follow-up data. Um, but we ended up then with a sample of 45 for this particular analysis. We did look to see if there were any significant differences between those that had um, both follow-up time points and those that didn't in their baseline characteristics. Um, and there, there were uh, no significant differences between the two groups. And we ended up with 25 who were in the past condition and 20 in the control group. And so we examined these changes in intermediate outcomes using a general linear model. We essentially looked at a group, which is where they in pass or in the control condition by time design. And so ideally what we'd wanna see is that both groups were fairly comparable at baseline. And if there was evidence that PASS was having a positive effect, we'd see the PASS group change more greatly over time that, than we would see in the control group. And so those were the outcomes that we were uh, looking to see if we had. Let me show you what we had. So we had a significant group by time interaction for resilience, general self-efficacy, and internalized stigma, in which what you see here, so in all of these graphs, the blue line will be the pass group. The gray line is the control group. And in general, what we see is the, the blue line, the pass group, let's say for resilience, is increasing from baseline to the end of semester one and then to the end of semester two. In general, what we see in the control group is really just no change. And so we're seeing that the past intervention looks like it's having a positive impact on resilience. Again, this is a fairly small sample. So these are encouraging findings. 
We see the same kind of pattern with general self-efficacy where the pass group Im improved over time and the control group primarily remained the same. And then with internalized stigma, which is something that we want to see decrease, is that the pass group decreased over time and that the control group primarily remained the same. What we also saw was a main effect of time. That is that both groups changed comparably over time, um, which is uh, an, an interesting phenomenon when we think about people who have volunteered to be in a study at a particular point, probably because they're recognizing a particular need that they have um, and, uh, and that they're struggling with something. Um, and that from that point forward for several, uh, for many of these students, there was a positive change in their capacities over time that was similar in both groups. So um, in time management, we had several different measures of time man management that reflected improvements in executive um, functioning. We see uh, essentially uh, improvement over time. Uh, we see improvement over time in, um, actually, I can't see what this is for where the things are on my screen. So, oops, sorry, let me go back. Uh, I'm just trying to move this. So it, it, in the second um, measure of time management, setting goals and priorities, they both get better over time. Some ways not too surprising, particularly if we have a lot of freshmen in the group that they're learning how to do that um, and the mechanics of time management. So a variety of executive functioning skills were simply improving for both groups over time. And academic self-efficacy, the belief that if you engage in certain activities that you will be successful uh, academically. Um, again, we might picture that people come in as primarily as freshmen and are um, unsure that they don't have great faith that they'll be able to do well. And what they learn over the first two semesters is that they are able to do the things that it takes to, to do well academically. We also saw a significant change over time in self-determination in academic self-advocacy, in academic self-empowerment, and in mental health help seeking. And then we found no significant main effects or interactions in psychological distress, in one aspect of time management, which was their preference for organization, um, in their academic help seeking. And we also, in the one um, sort of uh, measure of our ultimate outcome being their GPA, um, we did not see any change, significant change over time. Now with GPA, because a big chunk of the sample were freshmen, we couldn't have, we couldn't use a baseline GPA. And so this was a comparison of what their grade point, not their cumulative, but what their grade point average was for at the end of semester one, and then at the end of semester two. And with a larger sample, you could imagine that this may end up looking like a significant difference between the two groups. Um, we don't know if they were the same, they would have been the same at baseline. Uh, as I said, because there was no comparable measure for both groups at baseline. Okay, and let me share quickly some of the, well, actually, let me find out at this point if there are any uh, questions about the research findings and the, and the methods. I see Dory saying no. No, no <laughs> questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So let me offer a little bit about what we're thinking some of the conclusions are and what some of the next steps are for the PASS project. So essentially these pilot randomized control trial results demonstrated a couple of things. One is that we found that these outcomes are encouraging. This is a really small sample um, that had complete data for both time periods. We do plan to analyze changes from baseline to the end of the first semester for those who have those data and then from the first semester to the second semester for those who have those data so that we can um, include a larger number of the participants in the, in the analyses. But basically having seen with the small sample already um, some significant differences between uh, those in the past group and those in the control group is what we would consider to be um, uh, encouraging findings from a pilot study. 
We also found that most of the research methods, our capacity to randomize, our capacity to recruit um, a good size sample, uh, the particular measures that we had, that those research methods were, um, were good. We have met, modified our randomization scheme so that we're uh, better ensured of having uh, equal distribution of students who are Latinx in both conditions. And as you saw, we lost a fair number of students to follow up. We have also added methods in which we are in touch with every participant every month to, so that we can uh, minimize that loss over time and that we have a stronger capacity to, to collect longitudinal data. So those were our, our initial conclusions from the study. And then currently what's going on is that we have a fully powered randomized control trial that's funded by our current uh, Rehabilitation Research and Training Center grant. It's taking place on two campuses. It started in the fall of 2020 when everybody was basically uh, in, in school fairly, uh, almost everybody was remote. We were fortunate to have already developed those capacities in the spring of 2020. And so we were able to launch our large randomized control trial. Um, one, uh, one of those campuses being a large private university and the second one being a large public university um, that we're hoping for those who are interested in the past model that we will have some data that really um, provides uh, both information about the, uh, a, a larger scale effectiveness study, um, as well as um, how we can implement this model on new campuses. That was a big part of wanting to have a larger trial. And um, the, the large study will enroll 190 participants over three years. We're really smack dab in the middle of that three years of recruitment. And we've already recruited 100 participants into the current study. So we look forward to sharing those findings and answering more questions um, when we um, have completed that, that um, larger study. Uh, but would love to hear what folks are thinking about the past model, or if they have questions, if you have questions um, about the, the study um, as we've presented it, or even if you have questions about the larger study that is currently underway. A uh, question from um, a participant. Do you have this workshop in any other languages? Uh, perhaps will help to give or open opportunities to people of color or different uh, diverse communities. That's a great question. I, um, so this, this presentation right now is um, we have in English. Um, we, will, we have recorded it um, and we will be able to, to potentially translate it. Um, we've translated several of our uh, previous um, products from the Transitions to Adulthood Center for Research into American Sign Language, as well as into Spanish. Um, right now, the, the past manual for the coaches as well as for the supervisors are in English, but um, it is when we get to the point where we start to implement, be able to implement it, hopefully as an evidence-based practice, trying to make it available in different languages would be certainly be a priority. And then we have a couple more questions that kind of get into the weeds of um, the coaching uh, for Paul. Um, one question, Paul, was have we seen any differences around the types of classes perhaps participants have taken regarding online versus in-person or students across different majors perhaps seeking the intervention? Um, and then also, do we have any particular impact stories that you could share from the students or the coaches? Thanks, Story, and thanks for those questions too. From a class standpoint, uh, certainly last year, you know, almost all classes were, or many of the classes were online. Um, since then, you know, Boston University has been really kind of trying to move forward with being in in-person residential campus and there's not many opportunities to take online classes right now um, just because we're you know trying to kind of regain that residential campus and students really are looking for in-person classes as well from what we've seen students don't want to do online classes or zoom or anything like that same thing with the coaching piece because um, i do allow coaches to offer you know in-person or virtual coaching depending upon what the student's looking for and predominantly if not all students are looking for 
um, the in-person coaching piece of that, um, students the same with the classes that they're looking for. Uh, and then I definitely have um, some sentiments that students have shared, the impact that coaching has had on uh, the student. Um, you know, those tend to be kind of emails at the end of the year that I might receive or that a coach shares with me too, just from like a testimonial standpoint. I also have a lot of emails from coaches too on what it meant to coach and what it meant to support a student and build that relationship and build these skills and kind of have this unique role too. So um, I don't you have- share, that enough. Could you share one or two of those, Paul, just anecdotally? Yeah, and I, you know, I don't wanna misquote or misrepresent it too, but I think from a coaching standpoint, um, just kind of the impact and what it's like to build a relationship and to go really in depth and have a, a meaningful, impactful relationship with a student that you normally might not have met, you know, that you wouldn't have had that opportunity to build and create that relationship and rapport. And, and oftentimes coaches too will share that. I was so nervous that I didn't have anything in common at the beginning and things like that. But coaches recognize too, that at the end of the day, everyone has something in common and they're they're both BU students and sharing something that's been really challenging, you know, and something that kind of requires a lot of resilience to kind of overcome. And um, so coaches have been very fortunate with that too. And from a student standpoint, um, just the relationship and the flexibility and adaptability that the coach offered, being willing to meet in person, to text throughout the week, that it really kind of helped get acclimated and kind of get students in the rhythm and routine and schedule of being a BU student. Um, and then really kind of use those skills to, to move forward too. So it's not like you kind of get those skills and that's it, but rather you get those skills and supports and resources on campus and then use those to build upon um, to continue to thrive for their, uh, the rest of their time at BU too. I, I will add that I think we all recognize that it's really frustrating to have to wait for data have yeah. to wait for, for, for the findings. Um, and as I said, well, we think that these are encouraging findings that we have shared today. Um, we hope that the larger trial will, will uh, be more definitive in showing the ways in which past makes a difference. Um, and and it's, I think it's hard as sort of the lead researcher, I have to remain objective and hypothesize that it may or may not make a difference. Um, but we certainly are optimistic that there will be a difference that is very demonstrable and that we'll have a very good sense of exactly the ways in which it makes a difference. I have one more question uh, for Paul here. Uh, could you share just a bit more about the training that you provide to the coaches and when does that take place? Yeah, so predominantly coaching happens kind of in bulk at the beginning of the semester. And then again, we, we meet each week throughout the academic year for group supervision, which involves continued training as well. Uh, training kind of really starts with like kind of the core pieces of, of what it means to be a coach. And I think that's being a peer and recognizing the importance and empowerment that can come from peer coaching, uh, the, the listening and the responding and the empathy skills that are really needed to build those relationships and the importance of the relationship that I talked about understanding the resources on campus, understanding that a peer coach is not an expert on everything, but rather an expert on the resources and referring to students to those places as needed, understanding what coaching is and that it's not, it's different from mentoring and not talking back and forth, but rather it's skills-based and supports-based um, and action and goal-driven. Um, we do a lot of role-playing around certain situations. We do crisis management. We do suicide prevention. Uh, we kind of go through an emergency protocol system too, so that's that coaches feel very well supported in the process. And then use some of those activities that I showed you too, I'll kind of continue to introduce those as potential options for coaches to use. And I kind of do that throughout the academic year as well, depending upon what, what time of year it is, whether it be like a, a study technique or a finals kind of planning system, if it's kind of end of the semester, um, beginning of the semester, it's more of like the eight domains of wellness, support maps, um, getting connected to social activities, different things like that. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, and then um, uh, any additional thoughts about the areas of growth that were seen in both groups over time? And um, we've had a couple questions about having access to the recording and to the slides of this presentation. 
So uh, Marianne, uh, perhaps um, you want to speak to thoughts on the growth that are happening in both groups. Yeah, I, I think um, one of the sort of pleasures in research is seeing what the results look like. Um, and uh, it was, I would say, um, reassuring uh, to see that for these uh, young college students, uh, that in many of the skills that they were simply uh, uh, skills and capacities that with time, a lot of these skills and capacities develop. Um, and so I think, um, you know, for, for folks who may have a college student who's their child that they are concerned about, um, that who, who is attending college now, that some of these things just through the experience of college do improve with time. Um, and I, I find that encouraging. Um, I like to think that, that um, when they are having coaching that maybe it accelerates that uh, improvement over time. Um, and we'll, that remains to be seen, but I think a lot of the capacities that students go that may be a little shaky when they first start um, really do get um, refined and improve over time. So that, that's how I'm reading those findings. Um, but like I said, it's a, it's a fairly small sample. Um, and so I want to be a little cautious about that because uh, we may yet see that uh, with a larger sample that those who are getting coaching actually develop those skills a little bit more rapidly than those who aren't getting some coaching on them. And then this, uh, I'll show a final slide that provides um, how you can get a copy of the recording. Um, it will be circulated through our website, through our various social media and through our announcements um, as soon as it's, as it's been finalized. And um, I'll, I'll say finalized, our, our communications team knows a lot more about those details than I do. I did also just wanna share very quickly that as a result of our qualitative interviews, we found that faculty education about mental health conditions and ways that faculty can support students with mental health conditions um, could really use some uh, more information. And so we developed five training videos for faculty that we have just newly released that is available on our website. Um, and I don't know, Dee, if you wanna make any more information specifically uh, available about those training videos, I can also put up our final slide here, which is how you can contact us. Dee, are you there? Yep, uh, we will make sure that the, uh, when we send out the video and recording that the access to the past videos for faculty are also included a link to there. So folks can view those. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. I, we hope it was a good experience. Uh, please fill out our survey at the end. We really want to get your feedback and be on the lookout for future um, webinars by the Transitions to Adulthood Center for Research. And I want to say thank you to our three presenters. Um, thank you so much. And uh, we wish you and everyone a great day. Thanks, Dee. And thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.